see it. All right, good deal. All right, we will get started. <laughs> and this week, I tell you, the, the curriculum is, is just all over the place. They're opening up a lot of different topics and a lot of different subjects this week. So I'm just going to touch on some of these. Now, like I typically do, I, I don't try to regurgitate the curriculum that's that's already in the PowerPoints in the in your shells. Uh, I always try to just you know kind of push the envelope on some other things that's associated with this. So this week, uh, really, I'm going to get into something called threat-based auditing. I know we're talking about auditing in Unit Three. Uh, I'm going to talk about databases and go a little deeper into databases and security policy. Um, if when we think about auditing, the whole purpose of auditing, and really this goes to that, that I, four A's, remember that was the identification, authentication, authorization, access control, and that last A was auditing. And what that is, is that we wanna see what type of activity that individuals are doing while they are in on the network and while they're going from folder to folder or from one object, uh, trying to access objects, and really, that's when you really start looking for, you know, malicious activity, and you start seeing what type of activity that is going on on the network itself. So that is the intent, the purpose of, of auditing. Now, because our information systems have become so, so large until auditing is, is really more of an art than a science, and there's a lot of tool sets out there like Splunk and uh, other tools that we use to, uh, do, to do data analysis and, and data reduction because we're getting so much data now off of you know from, from our networks until this where you it's just overwhelming so that's why now we have to have automated tool sets i say like splunk splunk is probably one of the leading industry leaders right now uh that helps to do the uh data reduction but when we talk about threat-based auditing this is really starting to look at Almost, almost kind of the CSI, you know, the NCIS type shows, but really when you start looking at the different threats and start to understand how um, attackers will attack networks and you start looking for those specific types of things, you know, instead of trying to, trying to cover every hole, now you start to say, okay, how, let's look at these different attack vectors. So, and to start that, we have to kind of understand the different types of threat actors out there. Uh, everything from the what we call script kitties. Script kitties, like I said, these are they're not really kids, but we call them script kitties because they they're not really skilled hackers and attackers. What they do, you know, you can go out to the internet now and you can grab um, their their scripts. There's procedures, there's processes that's already written out there on the internet. So you don't have to be a, a skilled attacker. You can actually just go out and find these scripts and run them. That's what script kitties are. And many times, like I say, they are, um, their motives, it may be for money, it may be, and some is just for fun. But many of them, they do it just to see if they can get into your system. Uh, other things, other types is called hacktivists. Uh, like groups like Anonymous. You've probably seen that um, the little picture of the guy, the, the face with the voice, you know, with the, digitized voice in the background, uh, or, you know, LuzSec, Anonymous, and really they are, they, these are very skilled um, attackers, much more skilled than uh, the script kitties. And, and many of them have actually a really broad understanding of different programming languages, all, all your network stacks, all the different operating systems and protocols, and most of these guys, like I said, they are, they're politically motivated. And if you're looking at anything now, especially dealing with you know, COVID-19, you know, you've got anonymous already out there, you know, doing things, you know, trying to get governments to confess to doing whatever, but they are, they're politically motivated uh, organizations and individuals. Usually do not do this, they're not trying to steal money, uh, are trying to uh, hack for <clears throat> any type of financial gain, typically. Now, we was, another layer that we have is, and these are the more serious individuals, um, state-sponsored actors now what these are these are when we say state-sponsored not united states but other nation states that um are and they're and they they have a very political agenda 
And he actually, these are the kinds of guys that individuals and organizations really that are attacking one for what one country we use to attack another country. Um, and to attack your SCADA, your uh, supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And what these are, these are things like your, your industrial control systems for power companies and for utility companies. Uh, so these are very, very dangerous individuals. When we talk about state sponsored actors, uh, they're looking at doing long term damage and really, you know, it's really warfare at that point. Probably one of the biggest, though, still in most organizations from a business perspective is insider threats. Insider threats is what really, I know where I work in many organizations, they are really looking at how do you clamp down on the person who's already in your organization, who's working in your organization, who already have access, um, a legal access to certain uh, information infrastructure. Um, how do you how do you block them? And that is where auditing come in. That's where we really look at activity, look at what individuals are doing as they traverse across the network. And the way we look at that is uh, really understanding what we call the attacker, the kill chain. And this is a, a military term we used to use back in the military, Air Force, the Army, Navy, whatever branch. But the kill chain. Okay, how do we put bombs on target? Well, we we've taken that same mindset and overlaid it. In, in a cybersecurity environment, because the, the mindset is still the same. You have to have a target, you have to have some type of compromise and a breach. And the, the stages in this is, we're gonna walk through each of these stages, you know, the recon stage all the way to the persist stage. What the recon stage is, that's what we call the information gathering phase of an attack. Now really what they're doing then is where they're looking at potential targets. You know, that's where we, they, that, you know, just like in the military, we'd say, okay, what's, what, what are our, you know, targets set for today? Well, attackers, network attackers do the same thing. They're always looking for, you know, inf information gathering, looking for where potential targets are and who, who would be good targets. And then once they do that, once they see a target, let's say they want to attack, I don't know, Amazon or whomever it may be. It could be a government agency, you know, the, it could be, you know, Department of Treasury, Energy, whomever. Now that's the target. Now they start to let's de start develop some type of cyber weapon based on the on the recon on the on the reconnaissance intelligence. So they've started getting they've gathered a lot of information, a lot of feedback uh, through the reconnaissance effort. And we talked about this last week when we talked about uh, recon attacks uh, from social engineering um, to uh, doing information lookups, internet information lookups all the different things, man in the middle, that, that, that they do. Now we can start staging an attack. So now we know what our target is. Now we start building different types of viruses, different types of worms, phishing attacks, whatever it may be, to start having a weapon to develop. And once we stage it, then we have to launch it. You know, unlike the military, where we launch weapons off of, you know, F-22, F-16s, Navy uh, battleships, these attacks are launched you know, via email, email attachments, or those phishing emails you get. Um, leaving USBs laying around inconspicuously, or CDs, where people, you know, curiosity gets the best of them. Oh my God, here's the CD, here's the USB, I wonder what's on it. And they pop it in, and there's a virus on there. So that's how these attacks are launched. And after they launch it, and they have a successful launch, that's when they start the exploit phase. In the exploit phase, that's really where they're, now that, now that they're inside of your system, now they're inside of your network, that's when they start looking for weaknesses in your application, looking for operating systems that haven't been hardened properly, looking for pat, weak passwords, uh, user accounts that they can easily exploit. Um, a, a year or so back when the uh, um, Office of Personnel and Budget uh, was attacked. This is the, how they did it. They got into the, the system with the email. So, um, so some uh, user clicked on an email that had a Trojan in it. Now that happened six or eight months prior to the, the actual attack. So this is a very long term, what they call an APT, uh, Advanced Persistent um, uh, uh, Attack. <clears throat> So this could take over a year or so in these types of attack before 
uh, and looking for exploits where they're just laying there, laying quietly, watching and enumerating that network. Then that now once they get in and they've exploited the weakness, then they go into the install phase. And with the install phase, that's where the, the, the threat actor, he's got, he, they've done some type of privilege escalation where now they've got different privileges on the network. Uh, they probably escalated themselves up to where they've got uh, um, privileged user system administrator rights. So now what they want to do is, is to establish a backdoor, a way that they can easily get in and out of the network. And, 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 and that's done you know, several different ways. But, um, but really now, and especially if they, they want to start exfiltrating data, then that takes them to the, to the command and control or the callback area phase. Now, with the command and control, actually, you know, this is where we talked about uh, last week um, botnets, you know, and, and, and where they will plant, you know, a, a little bit of code called a botnet onto that system. And so now, and with the back door, whenever they want to reach it, they can just call up that little bit of code and that code, that botnet, now gives them um, ability to, to get in and out of that back door with ease. Or, or uh, also, it's, it's, it's really what is the communications channel. So now I can command and control my uh, attack from my computer because I've got a, a back door and I've got a piece of code that will allow me to, to communicate. Then from there is what we call actions on objectives. In the military, we used to call it war uh, heads on foreheads but that is to persist now this is where they actually start stealing information because they've set up the back door they've got that command and control link now I say hey look we we found what we want it could be social security numbers it could be corporate data it could be uh they may want to launch a a distributed denial of a service attack whatever it may be now they are able to do that and that's when they actually launch the actual attack itself in this phase, especially if they're trying to um, steal something off of the network, this is when they will start doing it using other protocols that we've talked about in this class, like uh, DNS, domain name service. What they'll do, they'll use Slack space in the domain, uh, in the uh, DNS protocol to just start dropping data into. And, and because DNS packets uh, pass back and forth all the time through your network, in and out, all the time because you always always doing that handshake if you remember dns that's what converts a common name to a an ip address and it has to go out to uh the dns uh server <clears throat> the ns lookup server uh database well most networks aren't really deep diving into those dns packets so what the bad guy will do is that they will just put a little bit of data like i said if they were would want to exfiltrate social security numbers out of the, a, a database that they found on the network. Well, what they would do, they'd take those social security numbers and um, hash them and then break them up into small chunks, put them on and just kind of stuff them into DNS packets that goes right through the firewalls, right back and forth, and it carries that payload back and forth. And they're able to control that with that command and control network, the CNC. So that's the attack kill chain from reconnaissance, stage, launch, exploit, install, CNC, and then the persist phase or the actions on objective. That's how attackers get into large networks and that's how they, they are able to do their damage. Now, from a cyber perspective, what we want to do, we want to start mitigating or start that attack or kill chain. And that's why we have cybersecurity capabilities at each stage to try to mitigate what that attacker is, attacker is trying to do. And what do we mean by that? So let's look at the uh, recon phase at the beginning. That's where our firewalls and our intrusion detection systems come in handy. That's why we deploy these. Because now, because we're at the recon phase, that's when they're trying to do things like in-map and trying to do scans and trying to do uh, uh, port scans and see what open ports. We want to be sure that our firewalls are blocking uh, any type of ICMP, uh, any type of pings that are coming in from the outside. Don't want to see any of those. 
And our intrusion detection and prevention systems, likewise, should give us an alert. Hey, somebody just ran NMAP. Somebody just did a port scan uh, on your network. And you should get that alert right up there, off the bat so you, so that you can start stopping that recon at the recon page. And if you do that well, many times the attacker will go, ah, this isn't a good target. And then they'll go look at another, another business, another stage. So let's say they make it past the recon. Well, then in the staging, that's where we use what we call threat intel. We get intelligence information from a lot of sources. As a matter of fact, this week, we're talking about some of those uh, different resources, you know, what, like the CBE, uh, the CERT uh, websites. That, uh, there, and there's a lot of the websites that's in our discussion for this week, but that's where you get threat intelligence. Because now, as a, as a cyber guy, if I'm smarter about what the, the threats are, I'll know how to better to launch my, my uh, security side of it. So let's say we still missed them in the, in the uh, uh, staging area. Well, when they go to launch, that's again, here again, that's why we want to have DNS security. We want to be sure that our DNS going in and out of our networks is secure. Uh, DNS sec, what we call that. Uh, email security, because many times that's how they're going to launch it, like I say, it was with a Trojan or they're going to try to bring in some type of virus or some type of worm through an email attachment or through a web uh, service. That's why we keep our email security to be sure that we got and that we're scanning all of our attachments and everything like that. It, likewise, on the website, that our, we maybe have a web proxy server that starts to, to block uh, web security traffic or try to monitor, maybe not block but monitor uh, web security traffic. Now let's say they even make it past the launch phase. So now at the exploit, this is where we run our network antivirus, anti-malware software on the network side, on our, on our servers, on our, um, uh, different your network devices that you've got those uh, hardened and locked down well so that, so that they don't get there. Even if they do, now we still wanna run uh, antivirus on the host because what they're gonna be looking for is some machine that they can get into, some machine on the network, some client that they can get into to actually overcome that machine. And then that gives them the back door into the server. So we, so that's why we run host antivirus, <clears throat> excuse me, like, you know, Symantec or Clam AV or uh, any of those types of, of host anti antivirus software. And let's say that they make it past that. That's why we still, again, on the callback. So even if they've gotten in, we want to try to block them from doing the callback at the CNC stage. And that's where our DNS security, our DNS sec, web security still should, should be there to help keep them from calling back. And in that persist stage, that's when we really do a lot of our, our, our auditing, our analytics, that's where we do the monitoring. We're monitoring network traffic. We're looking for spikes. We're looking for anomalies um, in usage. Uh, we're seeing that, you know, let's say we're, we're not running a 24 seven uh, type facility, but we see at two o'clock in the morning, wow, there's always every, every morning at two o'clock, there's a spike in, in network traffic. Well, that's what our analytics and monitoring tools that's some of the tools, as a matter of fact, that we've used uh, in this class in NetLab, like Security Onion, some of the uh, things in Security Onion, like uh, Bro and some of the different packages that come in Security Onion, um, or uh, Solar Winds. You know, there's different analysis, analytics, and monitoring tools that we can use to monitor network activity. So that's, that's a, a kind of a walkthrough of the attacker kill chain and how we look to mitigate that with uh, our different network and uh, cybersecurity tool sets. Any questions? I know that was quite a bit probably. No. Uh, all right, does that make sense? Yes. Oh, good. All right, let's switch gears real quick to talk about databases. Like I say, this, this week they opened up a lot of different topics. I'm only gonna pick two or three to talk about. Databases is very important and, and most, uh, Network guys, most IT guys, most cybersecurity guys, you know, we kind of turn our nose up at the, at, the, at the database managers. But understanding databases is very critical because many things, that, many of the attacks that are launched, many of the attacks that we get come through unsecured uh, databases. Databases that are not set up properly. Databases where it doesn't have input validation. What do I mean by input validation? 
Uh, let's say you have a field in a database that's supposed to be a phone number. Well, that field should be closed down so that the only thing that can be typed into that field is numbers and really should be only 10 digits. You should not be able to put alphabets, alphabetical characters in that field. Because if you are, then as an attacker, I can actually inject malicious code into that field. And so instead of putting in my phone number, like the form was asking for, I can actually do an injection of SQL code that can corrupt that database. Uh, that was one of the things I know we talked about last week in uh, some of your assignments was SQL, uh, SQL injection. And I actually put out some additional information of understanding that. But yes, because when you're searching for anything on the internet, if you go into Amazon, any of these websites you see, even though they look fancy and pretty, but right behind it, a layer behind that, is nothing but a database. And, and when you're doing a search or a query, then you, you're doing a query search, a, a SQL search, uh, on that database, a find new pair of shoes or whatever it is in Amazon, you're drilling down. And as you drill down deeper and deeper, it's just doing more and more queries. So understanding databases and how databases operate from a security perspective is very important, especially if you're working with a company that has a, a, a web presence um, and, and people can get into the site and, um, is they, and, and, and have forms and web-based um, forms and things like that. A lot of a lot of threats, attacks, and vulnerabilities happen from that perspective. Okay, so well, but now when we talk about databases, I think about data. Um, I say what really what data is? Like that's just um, an, an 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 object. Two types of data: structured and unstructured. And what do we mean by that? Unstructured data is probably about ninety percent of the stuff that we do day to day is unstructured, meaning it doesn't fall in into rows, columns, cells, tuples. It's things like, you know, all these things around the outside of this ring, all that 90%, that's all unstructured. Uh, PDF files, pictures, media, audio, video, you know, your MP3, all that stuff is unstructured. About 10% of the data that we work with is structured. That's actually in a database. Now, but here's the, uh, the great part about this. That 90% of structured data, unstructured data, is actually controlled by the 10% of the structure. Here's what I mean. Let's take YouTube, for instance. You want to find a, a YouTube video. And if you can, can you imagine how much video is on YouTube? And the, all those videos are unstructured data, meaning that, that it's not categorized, uh, the, uh, uh, a YouTube video, it's just a, just a lot of ones and zeros. But it does have a header on it that relates to a spreadsheet, so I mean a database, so that when you go to find and do a search, there's a database that you are querying that now knows where that video is located. So all the video, the massive amounts of video that's on YouTube still has to be categorized and, and managed with some type of back-end database. And then these types of databases are, are very, very huge, very complex databases. Now, when we talk about the components of a database, like I say, it's the data, which is the building blocks. Uh, then you have the database itself. Now, when you think about a database, many times we confuse the database with the DBMS, the database management system. Uh, the, the Microsoft Access is not a database. Microsoft Access is a DBMS, so the database management system. The database itself, actually, that is really, that's, that's where all your data is stored. That is the collection of data. And that could be, you know, tablature data and spreadsheets. It could be CBS files. It could be many things is how you store it. That is the database. With the DBMS, the database management system, like SQL, like Access, or Rational, the IBM system, that is what actually manages the structure and allows you to access the data. Uh, so that's what that does. And then we have metadata, which is very important. With metadata, what is that? That is data about data. Now, what that does, like I said, that is that provides a description of the characteristics of data. Uh, example of that is if you ever looked at your camera or your phone when you've taken a picture, a lot of times if you open it up, you see that it has the location where the picture was taken and the picture size. It tells you what's the aperture settings, 
all of that is metadata about the picture itself, about data. So metadata. So those are your database components. Now, when we look at a DBMS, the database management system like Oracle or SQL or, or Access or any of these, any of these things at the bottom, you know, and there's tons of database management systems. Like I said, again, what that is, that is the system that allows you to be able to access the data and provide outputs to a customer. So if like I say you may have end users who have a lot of data bases stored. You could have, uh, like I say, it could be Excel spreadsheets, it could be CBS files, it could be a host of different things. Then let's say this is access, I'll just use access because this one is pretty common. With that data, when you set up a database, what it allows now is a, a structured way to reach into these end user, app, end user applications and pull that data together. So now as a customer, I can query that data th through the DBMS. That is basically what you're doing when you go to Amazon. Amazon is running a huge D uh, DBMS. It could be a uh, uh, NoSQL or uh, Postgres SQL that's running. Now in the back end, they got warehouses that have data. They've got shipping that has data. Uh, they've got sales and accounting, all that has data. The DBMS then is able to query those. Now as a customer coming in, you wanna know, all right, I wanna know where this, this asset is. Uh, how, you know, I wanna find something on Amazon. Now you're able, when you just do that search, you're doing a database query. That's actually talking to the database and the structure of the database management system knows that, okay, let's go look at inventory control and see if we've got these. And then it provides you an input back on the screen. And, and you keep going through that process as you drill down. Okay, well, I found cameras. I found, let's see if I find 35 millimeter SL, digital SLRs. It's just still continue to query the database. Or let's say you've ordered one and you wanna know the status. You do the same thing. Then it goes into the, sh the warehouse shipping or wherever, and it pulls that up. So that is the inter interaction between the database, which is you know all of these, the database management system, and the, the query, the way you query that database. And when we think about databases, we also have to think about different data models, meaning how your data relates to each other. Uh, some key components of this is, well, first, we'll call it entity. Entity is, uh, entity is anything about which your data is stored and collected. You know, like I say, it could be Amazon, shoes, cameras, you know, makeup, uh, tractor parts. It could be whatever. That's an entity. An attribute is a characteristic of that entity. Black shoes, green shoes, you know, shoes with buckles. That's an attribute. Uh, relationship describes the association among entities. Now, when we talk about these relationships, you can have a one-to-one -one relationship, which you have, you know, um, let's say a one-to-one -one example of one-to-one -one would be one person has one social security number. That is a one-to-one. -one. So if I'm building up my database, I should never have one person in a field that would relate uh, to two social security numbers. A one-to-many relationship could be, it's kind of like a parent-child, you know. Uh, one father can have, you know, many sons, many children, but many of those children, if they could only relate back to one father, one-to-many within a household, within your family. You may have, like me, I got siblings. All of my siblings, we have one father but that one father has many children. So that's a one to many. Uh, many to many to many is kind of like your Facebook, like social media. You got many friends who could have a relationship with many other friends. So those those many to many in, uh, relationships. So we think about relationships. And, it's, and, and that's important when we start looking at relational databases because now these relationships is what governs how we're able to categorize and structure data and know how to search uh, for data. So when we look at a, a typical database model, okay, here's a database that has two tables. Uh, one table is a, no, is a table of customers. Another table is a table of agents. Now, when we look at this, 
uh, two separate tables, and these two tables could be stored on two different computers. It could be just like, uh, for instance, the agents, this, this may be the sales department keeps a, keeps a tab of the agents. Customers, this could actually be the, the advertising, um, marketing, or customer relations, HR. HR may have may maintain this data this uh, database. So these two tables could be in two completely different locations and areas. But what your DBMS does is able to now correlate these together based on the relationship or a linkage. Because if you look at both tables, they have something in common, a field called agent code. And that agent code field uh, or a key, and we'll talk about that next slide, is what is able to relate these two together. So we got agent code 501. Agent code 501 belongs to this agent, um, Alex Alby. 502 is uh, Leah Hahn. 503 is John Ocorn. Now, if I want to know what customers these agents have, I'm able to relate these two tables together by this one field. So now if I go over here and look at the agent code over here in my customer table, wherever I see 501, uh, wherever I have a customer, their agent code will tell me which agent. So now I'm able to actually, because I have a one to many, meaning I have one agent who can have many customers, a one to many relationship. And that's what's what this relational diagram is showing, that one to many. And that then the symbology is here. One agent can have an infinite amount of customers. Now going the other direction, it doesn't work that way because if you're a customer, you're gonna have one agent. That agent may change, but you'll only have one agent. So that is what that relationship. So now if I look at this table, say 501, so agent Alex Alby, he's got uh, Leona Dune as a customer, He's got Myron Orlando as a customer and on down the line, you know, and he also has Ann Farish as a customer. So that is the relational part of a relational database, how you're able to relate two tables that could be in multiple or completely different locations, but the DBMS is able to, to bring those together, and if I do a query, I want if I want to know how many customers, and I, you know, does uh, Alan Alby, I would my query would say look up agent code five hundred one, and five hundred one would pull up Alex Alby's name out of one table, and it would pull up the customers out of the other table, and then I could present that on a screen you know, in a, in a form or in a format, ever how I want to within the database management system. So how we do this is by using keys. The, in a database, uh, DBMS, in, in your database, there are different types of keys. Um, and you look at our list over here, and I'm not gonna get too deep in these keys except for two, uh, your primary key and your foreign key. Now we have a, what we call a super key. A super key, many times if I'm building a spreadsheet, I'll put a super key, I'll put a, the first column, column A. Uh, it's just going to be a, a sequential number column. One, two, three. So every time I load up a new record, it takes on the next number. That would be my super key. Uh, you can have a candidate key. Um, very similar to a super key, but I say it's a super key that doesn't contain all the attributes of the super key. So I can have another one key that if I just want to be able to sort on last name. That's how I had a, a spreadsheet and it had addresses in it. Last name, first name, home address, zip code, street telephone number. My super key is going to take cover all those attributes. But I could have another row that I would call a candidate key. And with the candidate key, I could just link that to just last name, phone number. So now, but the two that I really want to focus on is your primary key and your foreign key, because that's what made the tables relate on, on the last slide, was those two keys. Now, if I look in my, um, for, here's an example of painters and paintings, very similar to the one we did before. So in the table paintings, and basically what this is, this is uh, a list of paintings. And each painting is painted, and there's a painter who painted each of these paintings. 
So if I look at my primary key, that would be the painting number. And you see that's sequential, it starts at 1338, 1339, 1340. Not that, it, no, no nothing, nothing cosmic about that. Now in this table, I have a primary key and that would be my painter's number. The primary key in this table relates to the foreign key in this table, which is the same one. So primary key in table one is gonna be the foreign key in table two. Table two is the one that tells me who the painter is. So 123 is Ross, uh, Georgette Ross. That is a foreign key in this table that relates to the primary key in this table. So that tells me that one tw that that um, Georgette Ross painted Dawn Thunders, painted Ro Vanilla Roses to Nowhere, and painted Hasty Exit by being able to do that relationship. So that is how a relational database pulls things together based on the keys, based on the primary key, based on the foreign key. Now, over the years, databases have evolved tremendously, tremendously. You know, when we first started out with databases, they were, they were pretty much what we call hierarchical databases, you know, which means you started here and it just kind of filtered its way down. And it, it did, it had a set of one to many relationships between a, a parent's uh, set of data and then you had the children leg segments under that. Network database was very, very similar. The, the problem with a hierarchical, because it is, this is kind of top to bottom, um, you couldn't do ad hoc queries. And what I mean by ad hoc, uh, where you could do very fast queries because you had to start at the top and work your way down through each record to find, and that's how the query set was done. Um, all, all your paths were predefined. So it, it made it very structured and very rigid. Now, where we're operating at now is really with relational databases. What I kind of hear with um, relational data and, with, and relational database is very similar to what we just talked about, uh, where you have re entity relationship models. And a lot of our databases still are, are relational or ER type databases. Now, where we're headed and where we're really kind of going to is semantic uh, databases, whether it's object-oriented or the extended relational. Now, with semantic databases, and this is what you see working with systems like Amazon and things like that, is where the, now they recognize words. So now you don't have to sit and type in a, a SQL query, you know, colon, backslash, 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 search if, then, you know. No, now you just type in, Amazon shoes, you know, so because it's, it understands semantics, it understands it's, uh, more of a, of a more human. It's more related to what we do from a human perspective, and also when we talk object oriented, it actually looks at data as a, a data set as an object itself. So you're able to really drill down, and 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 that's how we're able to make these databases so much faster and so much more powerful uh, because our database structure have really it has grown, it has matured over the years. All right, we're gonna switch gears one more time. We talked about databases, um, we've got into the attack kill chain. Now let's talk about security policy. When we think about security policy, really everything that we do should be grounded in policy from a security perspective. If you're a cybersecurity analyst, if you're a cybersecurity engineer, whatever role, everything that we do should be grounded in policy. So when we talk about security policy, we wanna be sure that one thing, it should be unobtrusive, meaning we are a support function for that organization. Um, they, the day-to-day -day end user should be able to focus on their day-to-day -day task and not be obstructed because we've written uh, overburdened some security policies. Um, but our policy should be rigid enough that we can protect critical resources and our critical assets and critical objects. And it also should be able to demonstrate, you know, for the, for the organization that uh, they are able to operate securely because we do have secure policy in place. Now, when you think about developing secure security policy, network policy, especially, um, there's some things you always want to look at. Policy should be written, and sometimes as cyber, cyber network IT guys, we are our own worst enemy. 
because we will write policy that is cyber security or IT centric. The only people who can understand it is other cyber and IT people. People who work in sales and marketing and production, the guys down on the floor bending metal, making stuff, they don't have a clue what half the terminology even means because we're using our language. So policy should be easy for ordinary users to understand ordinary users and to comply with. Also, this is a big one, it has to be enforceable. Just by putting a policy in place, if you can't enforce it, that's a waste of paper, waste of ones and zeros, waste of time. So if there's no clear stated objective and, and it's not enforceable, it's not worth writing the policy. Some things you wanna look at so as you start to develop security policy. These are just some areas, some basic elements of your security policy, your overall security uh, policy architecture. It should contain a privacy policy. That's just describing, you know, and letting your, your everybody know up front what they can expect from monitoring and reporting. If you're in the Department of Defense, if you've ever worked in, 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 with the US government, right up front, when, as soon as you log in, you get this DOD warning banner. And that warning banner tells you specifically that you are subject to search, seizure, um, confiscation, you know, please do not ex expect privacy and by clicking OK that you agree to those. So that's what your privacy policy is. That way so that people know right up front that, yes, this is what we're monitoring. This is your expectations of privacy. Also, acceptable use policy. That needs to be very clear because otherwise you kind of run into those gray areas of, well, can I go out on the Internet? Can I, you know, surf Amazon doing work hours? Unless that's clearly spelled out. Authentication policy it also describes you know, how people will authenticate themselves on the network when they come on. Do I need a password? Am I using a token? How often do I change my password? What should my password length be? All those things, again, should be well spelled out in your policy. Internet use policy, very similar to acceptable use, but it's, it, this is specifically how the, the, the proper and improper ways of using the internet resources. Um, uh, so again, spelled out well. Some other things that we look at: access policy, meaning that okay, wh where what specifies you know how and when you, you as the users can access the network. Uh, it may be twenty four seven. It may be that you only have access to the network eight hours a day. Uh, it only, or you don't, you can't use your laptop. You can't remote in. All this, all those type of things should be well articulated. Uh, auditing policy. Meaning that, okay, if there's a violation, if, you know, while I'm auditing the network, I see that an individual have done something that appear to be malicious. So what are the, 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 the ramifications? Um, let individuals, let, let the users know right up front, if you're caught with this, with pornography on our system, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, last one to look at is data protection. Really, it's like yeah, understanding how we're gonna run virus protection. How do you back your systems up? You know, your files backed up daily. Are they backed up monthly? How are you, how are those processes, what is your, your, do you have a drip, a disaster recovery plan? All of that needs to be, you know, kind of looked at when you, when you start writing out your, your security policy. And, and probably one of the most, and this is many times, again, you know, cyber, sometimes we're our own worst enemy with this. We don't really take a good risk assessment to understand what in our organization needs to be protected, you know? And that should be really a part of our contingency response plan and our incident response plan. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to spend more money protecting something than what the asset is worth. And also you want to know that you're protecting the right things that, from a customer perspective, uh, from, the, from the, the operational side that, Many times we spend a lot of resources protecting the wrong things. Uh, from there, you do you know threat analysis, risk assessments, so that we we are ensure that it, that you're doing likelihood analysis. What is the likelihood of this happening here? If I live in um, Oklahoma, what is the likelihood of you know a a monsoon? Pretty low. What is the likelihood of a tornado? Pretty high. So understanding those things, so as you write 
security policy, it needs to be based on what the risk and the risk assessments and the threats vulnerabilities are for that individual area where you are. Okay, we've covered a lot of stuff tonight, haven't we? We got like to say everything from threat-based auditing, uh, the attack kill chain, we kind of dug a little deeper into databases and understanding uh, the, the components of databases. And we took a, a look at our security policy, how to write policy, things to, to focus on as you put together a security policy. Really the big thing, know what you're protecting, be sure that your policy is enforceable. If you can't enforce it, if you don't have leadership um, buy-in, then the policy may not be worth the time that you're writing it on. All right, any questions? Now is the time before we uh, log it off. None here. All right, you, you, you captured all that. You're awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> but if I have any questions, like I say, my email address is out there. And uh, uh, by all means, uh, uh, contact us. All right, have a great night, great evening. Like I said, these uh, PowerPoint and the recording will be up online shortly. Take care. Bye.